How much of the Harry Potter world was built for real? And how much of it only existed on computers? Let's dive into the world of cinematic magic. Who knew that chess could be so terrifying? Anyway, it took a lot of work to bring this crazy sequence to life, but was it created through practical means or digital ones? The answer may surprise you. Production designer Stuart Craig designed the pieces from scratch and the SFX crew sculpted them the old school way. But how did the statues move across the board? Surely that was done digitally. Nope. The SFX crew used radio control techniques to get the statues to move around, though some CGI was applied in post-production to make their movements seem more natural. Now that's impressive, but what about when the pieces battle each other and explode? Surely those parts were computer generated? That scene actually happened the way it appears on the screen. The filmmakers obviously couldn't use explosives as those would have seriously injured the actors, so they used compressed air devices to turn the stone into rubble. Unfortunately, not everyone was happy about how this scene turned out. In order to make the game seem more authentic, international chess master Jeremy Silman was hired as a consultant. His goal was to honor the great game and make sure it was given the respect it deserves, all the while servicing the needs of a script that required action and destruction. However, his advice was ignored in favor of statues being smashed to pieces, and Jeremy wasn't happy about it. Upon seeing the movie, he described the scene as mumbo jumbo, and that was that. But there's no denying the degree of technical magnificence that went into creating the chess game, even if it did pee off the chess community. Checkmate! The chess scene wasn't the only surprising use of practical effects in the Philosopher's Stone either. In order to avoid spending gazillions on CGI, the SFX team used a good old-fashioned puppet to create the Devil Snare plant. The tentacles were then wrapped around the actors and controlled by their masters behind the scenes. After that, the film was reversed to give off the illusion of a plant tormenting innocent children. The Chamber of Secrets is full of impressive sequences too. For example, the flying car stands out as especially neat. But how did the filmmakers go about bringing this insanity to life? It was a combination of practical and digital effects, obviously. I mean, come on, cars can't fly. But there are ways to make them seem like they can, as evidenced by this movie. To make the 1962 Ford Anglia take to the skies, the special effects wizards fitted the vehicle onto a rotating crane that was attached to a gimbal head. This allowed the filmmakers to spin the car backwards and forwards as they saw fit and capture it on film. With that problem solved, the gimbal head was then attached to a pickup truck with a specially fitted suspension and outriggers. This was so that the filmmakers could create all kinds of flying effects while on the move. CGI was needed to create the backdrops and scenery, but Ron and Harry really did get to roll around in an airbound vehicle. And the best part? The actors had a lot of fun! Like the flying car was one of my favorites because it was like being on a thing part ride. Of course, we can't talk about the Chamber of Secrets without mentioning the Basilisk. This slithery menace might be the most fearsome foe in the entire Harry Potter franchise after all, but how was it created? There appears to be a theme developing here, as the King of Snakes was also the product of both practical effects and CGI. While the majority of the Basilisk's serpentine movements were computer-generated, a 25-foot, life-sized, animatronic creature was used for the close-ups. Adding a practical component saved money, as CGI shots cost $100,000 back then. However, the filmmakers felt that they needed something more tangible for the epic final showdown between Harry and the creature. That's enough death and destruction for the time being. Let's move on to something more lighthearted. The Marauder's Map is the most fun item in the Prisoner of Azkaban. Brilliant! Where'd you get it? But it wasn't easy to create by any means. Mirafor Amina was tasked with designing the map, but she didn't anticipate the scope of its importance early on. According to Mirafora, the map was a mystery to her at the time, so she designed it like a scroll so that new parts could be added whenever they were needed. Needless to say, she did a great job. 
Now let's find out how the filmmakers added that special magic to the map. The parts where dots can be seen moving around the paper were obviously computer generated, but the special effects also used some real life magic whenever possible. Famous illusionist Paul Keeve was brought in to create the self-folding version of the map that can be seen in Lupin's office. The decision to keep this sequence practical was simply because the filmmakers didn't want to rely on CGI if they could help it. That's because it's much more difficult to control digital tricks. They have a mind of their own. So through a combination of low-tech and Paul's own illusionist wisdom, they gave the map an old-school flavor. Now some of you are probably thinking, big whoop. Magicians and illusionists have been making objects come alive since the days of early theater. But have they caused actual human beings to inflate? When special effects supervisor Nick Dudman read the Prisoner of Azkaban script, he assumed that Aunt Marge's takeoff would be entirely digital. He was wrong. Alfonso Cuaron insisted that minimal CGI was used throughout the movie, and this scene was no different. Actress Pam Ferris was put into latex bodysuits that were pumped full of air, then pulled up by wires, which were controlled by rigs. Maybe CGI would have been easier though, as shooting the scene caused poor Pam to pass out as the costume stopped her lungs from expanding. The Goblet of Fire took the franchise in a more ambitious and epic direction, but the filmmakers still chose practical effects over CGI for the most part. Take Mad-Eye Moody, for example. It would probably have been pretty simple to use computer-generated shortcuts to make his Mad-Eye do its thing, but where's the fun in that? Instead, the filmmakers opted for an animatronic creation that was operated through radio control. Unfortunately, the device wasn't perfect. You see, it had a habit to keep falling out of its holder. So the FX department had to make a special wig for actor Brendan Gleeson that would accommodate the eye and help keep it in place. The Triwizard Tournament scenes needed a lot of CGI though, especially when it came to the water task. Check out this behind the scenes clip for a taste of what the actors had to go through bringing this task to life. So champions, you may begin now! There's no way that the performers were going to avoid getting wet, but the CGI was essential for adding the creatures and scenery at the end of the day. Still, I'm sure if there were any lakes with mermaids out there, the filmmakers would have considered shooting there. Because if there's one thing the Harry Potter franchise digs, it's keeping it real. Of course it's happening inside your head, Harry. Why should that mean that it's not real? The Order of the Phoenix was also rife with computer-generated spectacles. Over 1,300 VFX shots were needed to make this sequel, so you can just imagine how time-consuming that must have been. However, according to director David Yates, the biggest challenge was making sure that each shot wasn't there for the sake of it. They had to serve the story. But some of them were very challenging, regardless of their purpose. The Hall of Prophecy sequence gave the filmmakers some headaches. This environment was completely CG, and it had to be shot on green screens over the course of several weeks as it was so complex and elaborate. Here's what special effects wizard John Richardson had to say about this sequence. What makes it complex is working out with the visual effects department, who's doing what and where the joints are going to be. We did a lot of pre-preparation to get everything ready in terms of what David wanted and then worked together to make it happen. Hard work paid off though, as it's a damn fine battle. Speaking of battle, let's talk about the one that ended it all. The ultimate fight between good and evil. The end of Voldemort once and for all. I'm talking about the Battle of Hogwarts, of course. CGI was used to create Hogwarts exteriors since the first movie, but this version of the school was a different beast. The digital environment encompassed 10 miles of terrain at its widest point, and the effects team used over 3,000 individually painted 4K textures to complete the grandiose visuals. Additionally, the effects team had to create the CGI shield that was put up to guard Hogwarts, as well as the wand effects that Voldemort and his goons used to destroy it. The set was also too large for a green screen sometimes, so the filmmakers were constantly changing lighting setups and rotoscoping the actors in order to get the right shots. At the same time, the big battle required a lot of practical magic as well. All of the interior scenes took place on actual sets that were built from scratch, including the marble staircase where a large portion of the action takes place. Here's what it looked like before post-production added some excitement to the mix. 
The story behind all of the rubble is interesting, too. That's right, cinematic rubble is more complex than you think. Like the majority of this franchise's approach to the creative process, it was a combination of everything. During the early stages, it was important to build every brick from scratch. However, in order to save time and be flexible later on, the special effects team created unique software that allowed them to paint in the destruction, then run a simple rigid body simulation to drop the rubble onto the staircase. Confusing much? Of course it is. But if it weren't for these genius nerds, we wouldn't have one of the best battle scenes in cinematic history, so let's thank them for their hard work. If you want to know more about the creation of the Harry Potter flicks, be sure to check out our video on what the films look like without CGI.